All right, good to see you all here this morning. I want to <coughs> give you <coughs> a few thoughts for the new year, being uh, New Year's Eve tonight. You know, maybe some of you after church tonight are going to try and uh, make some of the fireworks. We're going to try and see uh, there's a fireworks in Liverpool, you know, at, uh, at Warwick Farm. So we're going to try and get to that. If it's too busy at Warwick Farm, maybe we'll go on the other side of George's River and try and see it from the uh, Chipping Norton side. So that's what we're going to try and do tonight at 9 o'clock for the kids. But, you know... <clears throat> New Year's, it's a good time to <clears throat> stop and reflect on how your life is doing, isn't it? Um, you know, like the Bible says, it's good to go to the house of mourning rather than to the house of feasting, because that's where, you know, everyone ends up, you know, at funerals. Everyone dies eventually. And just like it is good for man to go to a funeral now and then and reflect on what your life is about, I feel like as every year passes, you know, one year of your life is disappearing. And I think this, this is a built-in mechanism, I think, that God has given us to reflect on time past. Uh, this year gone by, never to be seen again, you know, makes you reflect on the year ahead. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing that as we lose time, it makes us reflect on the time ahead and how we live our lives. So these are four things in this sermon today I want to share with you uh, this morning to complement the setting of your own goals because you're going to have your own personal goals and you know that you, you'll set those own personal goals yourself. But these are four things I want to uh, give to you this morning from God's Word um, to complement the setting of your own personal goals for the new year. All right, so the title of the sermon is Biblical Resolutions. For the new year. Now, the first one I want to talk about is one break bad habits. Break bad habits. We've all got our bad habits, you know, but, you know, we've got to try to break them. 1 Corinthians 6 says here, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, are, are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of of any. Now, not all bad habits are sinful in and of themselves. Sometimes they're just bad habits because they're done in excess, or you just do them too much, and then, you know, they become a bad habit where they just, that's just the way you live. What is a bad habit? A bad habit is something that you just do consistently. It's not necessarily a sinful thing to do, but it's not a profitable thing to do. It might be a vain thing to do, but you just do it too much, and it just becomes this bad habit, and sometimes it becomes an addiction where you, you can't stop doing it. And the Bible is saying here that although thing, all things may be lawful, it may not be sinful necessarily for you to do this particular thing, but you don't want to be brought under the power of it. You don't want it to be sapping all your time, sapping all your energy, you know, the opportunity cost of doing this thing as opposed to serving God or growing in your faith. Now, what are some examples of bad habits? You know, you've got the ob obvious ones to Christians, you know, smoking, even vaping. So sometimes people, you know, they stop smoking so that they vape. But, you know, va vaping is also a bad habit. It's also something that you're wasting money on, you're addicted to. So you don't want to just go from one bad habit to another bad habit, even though it might not be as bad as the, 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 first, you know, the previous one. You want to get these bad habits out of your life because, you know, when I think about bad habits... It's also a bad example, isn't it? It's a bad example to the next generation. It's a bad example to friends and family. You know, if you take on these bad habits, then it makes other people that you associate with, your circle of friends, also comfortable with these bad habits. So whether they're the obvious ones, like smoking, uh, vaping, you know, drinking alcohol, what about just eating too much food, gluttony, you know, and just, just indulging in too much and just in, in excess? Uh, what about immodesty? You know, Im immodest dress, that's another thing that I think is a bad habit where people, um, you know, just get comfortable just wearing too little clothes. And just like anything in life where you, a bad habit, it just becomes something that you're comfortable with. And I think immodesty is one of those bad habits where ladies just get comfortable wearing too little clothes. And, and that, again, can impact the people in our circle of influence as well. What about pornography? Pornography can be a bad habit, you know, where you just find yourself going back 
watching things you shouldn't be watching, looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. And this goes for men and women. You know, it's not, pornography is not just something that affects men, it's something that affects women as well. And now with, you know, the mobile phone and social media, it's just so easy to go back to seeing things and looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. What about swearing, our, our language? You know, so you know, when I, before I was a Christian, I used to swear a lot. I swear the F word. You, know, you say it with your friends. You, know, you hang around with friends that swear and that language kind of rubs off on you. But no, we've got to break those bad habits as believers. You know, we just don't want these bad habits as believers. Bad things. You know, even myself, you say, well, Victor, I don't hear you. So I, there's still words that I say that I feel like I shouldn't say. And, and you know, it's just a bad habit because I want to get those things out of my vocabulary because, you know, I don't want my children saying these things. So these are bad habits. So I'm not just talking about these have bad habits that I'm listing here. I'm not just listing all the things that I don't do. I mean, hey, these things uh, affect me as well. Swearing. What about worldly music? You know, music is something that just gets into us and just stays with us. And we just find them just singing the tunes, just hymning the tunes. And then, you know, and we're singing the lyrics. And then we, we reflect on the lyrics. And we're like, man, these lyrics are so ungodly. These lyrics are like talking about sex and talking about drugs and talking about, you know, ungodliness. And yet, you know, we'll listen to this music and just, just repeat it to ourselves again and again and again and again. And the, these words just live in our heart. You know, I want God's Word to live in my heart. That's, that's what I want. I want to memorize God's Word, have God's Word, you know, resounding in my mind, not the, the words of the ungodly and the worldly of this world. Um, you know, what about the bad habit of laziness? You know, just sitting around, just doing nothing, just being idle, wasting time. You know, we need to break these bad habits and we don't want laziness to become, you know, something that starts to affect our health. You know, some people, they're, they're so lazy that they, they don't exercise. You know, they don't go out, get, get moving and, 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 you know, do something so to, to, to stay healthy. And then they start putting on too much weight and, 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 and it makes them, you know, less effective for the Lord. So laziness. What about sleeping in? No, oh, gosh, these are the ones that are getting a bit too close to home now. You know, sleeping in, that's a bad habit, you know. I think, like, that's a habit, like, you, like, build in, you know. Like, you're already, you're already planning that bad habit the night before. I know, like, I've snoozed. You know, you say, okay, I'm going to put a few alarms because I'm already planning to, like, sleep in. <laughs> it's, it's terrible, you know. We gotta get, I reckon we've got to get into the good habit of just, like, you know, when that alarm goes, just get up, get going, you know. Just you know, plan when you're going to wake up and then just get up and, and you probably feel better as well. Because, you know, they say when you, when you sleep in and you snooze, you end up, you know, just really getting a bit more groggy. Whereas if you just, like, woke up, when you woke up, you would, you would be a lot better. Sleeping in. What about punctuality? You know, punctuality, being late all the time, is a bad habit as well. You know why? Because you don't plan ahead. You don't, you, you're in the bad habit of just not allowing enough time to get somewhere on time. So something we can break a bad habit is let's start allowing more time. You know, if you find you're always 10 minutes, 5 minutes late, then leave 15 minutes early. Leave 20 minutes early so that you're on time. And that's a good habit to get into, not just, you know, out of respect for people's time, but even, you know, work and, you know, business deals and things like that. People don't like people that are unreliable and late. So punctuality. What about uncleanliness? That's a bad habit as well, isn't it? Uncleanliness, not putting things back at home, you know, you know, not cleaning up and, and things like that. That starts to become a bad habit as well. And we don't want to be people that are unclean. Cutting corners. What about procrastination? Procrastination is a bad habit. Simon's looking at me, you know, procrastination is when you put things off. You know, you need to do something, but then you procrastinate, you just start getting distracted with other things. Right? That's what procrastination is. Procrastination is not doing the things you should be doing and putting them off till the last minute. And what about time wasting? Uh, this is a big one for me. I just waste too much time. It's on social media. You know, maybe you waste too much time you know, watching uh, that new series on Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Um, you're wasting time just watching TV. You know, maybe this year you'll say, you know what, I'm not going to start that new show, that new series. I'm not going to start watching that that thing, you know, I'm going to try and spend less time on social media and use that time for something more productive, use that time for something better. And a lot of these bad habits, you know, not only waste money, but they waste time. So how do we overcome these bad habits? Well, 
first, it's got to start with a desire to stop these bad habits. It's like they say about drug addicts. You know, if you don't, they don't want it themselves. There's nothing you can do to help them. And it's the same in the Christian life. You know, there's, there's nothing that can help your Christian life if you don't want to do it yourself. So you, first, it's got to start with an actual desire to want to change something. This is why the Bible says here, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is one of our memory verses. You know, I, I preach a lot on our memory verses. These, these verses are, are so good, you know, and they, and they help guide and, and help you make wise decisions in life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says here, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So this is very important because sometimes when people go through, you know, trying to overcome temptation, trying to overcome sin in their life, Sometimes they feel that they're alone in that struggle. That this is something, oh, you know, nobody can relate to. This is something just unique to me. And the Bible says here that there's no temptation that you face that is unique to you, that it's, it's common to man. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. So this is something encouraging as well, that any sin that you go through or anything you try and overcome is not greater than you are able to bear. That's what this verse says here. So any temptation or trial or struggle that you have personally in your own life, you know that you are able to overcome it because God will not tempt you above that you're able to overcome. But how do you overcome it? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So there's always a way out of this temptation. There's always an alternative. But here's my point here, is you need to be looking for that alternative. You need to have your eye open. You need to want to escape that temptation. If you just dive two feet in, blind to any of the escapes that God offers to you, then no amount, nothing can help you, right? Because you don't want to help yourself. But if it starts with a desire, if you actually want to break those bad habits, there will be a way to escape. There will be alternative things to do to, 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 to get rid of those bad habits. One thing you can do, hey, you know, don't dwell in the past. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Just confess your sins to God and move on. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God is willing to forget the past and forgive and move forward. Don't you do something that God, you know, is not even doing. Like God doesn't hold on to it and hold you back, but yet, you know, it's ourselves that hold us back. We look to our past and say we've done this and you know, don't move forward, but no, we should just confess our sins and and move forward. Ask for prayer from others. You know, you don't have to necessarily make it a public prayer request, but, you know, ones that you're closer to, people that you build, you know, trusting relationships with, share your faults with them and share your struggles with them so that you can pray for one another. James 5.16, confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13, the Bible says here, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So you don't want to defeat yourself. You know, when you're trying to overcome a bad habit, don't already have the negative attitude of, ah, oh, you know, I can't change this, this is just how I am. You know, I can't do this, I can't do that. No, the Bible says I can. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So it doesn't matter what the bad habit is, which one it was on the list, you can't have the attitude of, I can't do this, I can't do that, because the Bible says you can. You can overcome that bad habit. You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. So don't defeat yourself. It's already hard enough fighting the struggle. Don't in your own mind defeat yourself, because you can. Philippians 4.13. And the last point I want to talk about this one is, when breaking bad habits, is 
You know, the secret to breaking bad habits is you need to replace it with good habits. You can't just focus on the bad habit and just try and cease doing the bad habit without replacing it with something else. And this is why when the Bible talks about even doing the right thing, it's always in contrast to, do, you know, when you're putting, doing, stop doing the wrong thing, it's always in contrast in doing something right. You don't just stop doing the wrong thing. Like, oh, I'm just not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. You know, it's like staring at, you know, a bowl of sweets and saying, okay, well, don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it. You know, it's on your table, it's right there. You know, so you, a lot of people at New Year's, they try trying to, you know, they got their dieting uh, resolutions and all that. Yeah, well, you know, you've got you to get that stuff out of sight. You know, you don't have the, the, the bowl of sweets on your desk at work, you know, and say, oh, I'm not going to eat it, I'm not going to eat it, I'm just not going to eat it. You know, you have to replace it with good. Maybe replace it with a bowl of uh, your carrot sticks or something like that. So you've got to replace bad habits with good habits. And that's, you can go down the list of all the bad habits we talked about. Think about, you know, some different alternatives of how, what you can replace it with. But here's some verses on it. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So you see how it's not just, just resisting the devil. You submit yourself to God. So you see how you're replacing one thing with another. Ephesians 4.22, look at what it says here. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You see, it doesn't stop there, does it? You're trying to put off the old man. You're trying to get away the bad habits, the old sinful man, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, so you're replacing it with a refreshed perspective and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you see, you stop doing one thing, you replace it with something good, and then therefore you start building new habits, start building good habits. Romans 13, 12. Look at what it says here. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. You see, again, it's not just about stopping doing what's wrong. It's about then striving purposefully, proactively, trying to do what's right. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So you see, you don't want to allow room for that bad habit to come back. So if you have this bad habit, you know, and you stop doing it, we'll replace that time, replace that activity with something good so that you don't have this idle time for this bad habit to creep back in. All right, so number one, biblical resolutions for the new year, let's break bad habits. All right, it's going to start with a desire, pray to God for help, pray for one another, right, and, and replace the bad habit with a good habit so that you start building a good habit rather than being tempted to fall back into the old bad habits. So, on the topic of replacing bad habits with good habits, number two, number two biblical resolution for the new year, set some spiritual goals. Set some spiritual goals. Right, so people at New Year's, they're always setting personal goals, career goals, all these sorts of goals. And it's not that those goals are bad to have. But we, we're so focused on setting our own personal goals that we completely forget to set some spiritual goals, some things we're going to do for God, you know, and, and to grow in our spiritual walk. We don't want to get content with where we are spiritually. You know, the Bible talks about being content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? So talking about material things, we should just be happy with the things that we have. But we don't want to be content with just where we are in life. We want to strive for excellence. We want to strive for spiritual excellence. So we don't want to get content with where we are and then just coast in the spiritual life. And that's what happens with a lot of believers is they get to a point where they feel like they know it. They feel like they're doing you know, everything they're comfortable doing. And they just coast in the Christian life. 
And you know what happens when you coast in the Christian life? You don't just coast gradually forward and upward. You know, when you start coasting, you just start backsliding. That's what happens when you coast in the Christian life. And this is why you can't just get content with where you are in the Christian life. You constantly need to be striving for perfection. And this is why this, this pursuit of perfection and this pursuit of spiritual excellence should never end in your Christian life. It should always be moving forward. Philippians 3, 7. For what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. You see how Paul's worldly accomplishments, his accomplishments in the physical world, he's saying, well, these are nothing compared to what I should be striving for in Jesus Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. See those worldly accolades in comparison to what he does for Jesus Christ? He's saying they're like dung. You know, they're, they're animal feces. That's what he's saying. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What, do you mean, what does he mean by that? Attain unto the resurrection of the dead? Because when the dead is resurrected, they are perfect not only in spirit, but in body also. Right? So this is what he's saying. He's saying, I am striving for perfection, not as though I had already attained. So he knows he's not there. Right? This is why you can't coast in the Christian life. You can't just be content with where you are in the Christian life because you're not perfect. Right? But you should be striving for perfection. You're not there. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's seeking to follow that which he has believed, Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Look at this. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, did it sound like Paul just coasted in the spiritual life? Did it sound like Paul was just content with where he was? I mean, if anyone could claim to have arrived, I mean, it's Paul. I mean, we, re we see his life in Acts and, you know, his works, his attitude his zeal. And yet he says, no, nah, I haven't arrived. I'm constantly pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. You know, this is what we have to do, right? Matthew 5, 43. Look at what the Bible says here. You've heard that it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? You see how some people may just get to a certain level in their spiritual life and just say, well, well I love my brethren, but I don't love these people. No, that's, that's not good enough. You know, you need to go further than that, like God did. It says here, if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. You see there, see how, you know, the attitude of not striving for perfection, right? not striving for excellence. It's not a biblical attitude. Because the Bible tells us here in Matthew 5, 48, hey, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And that's not to say that, you know, obviously we, you know, we're not perfect, so we try and do our best, but our attitude should be to strive to do our best 
to strive to be perfect because why? Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven, is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. So when we're setting our goals for the new year, hey, make sure we have some spiritual goals set. What are some examples of spiritual goals? Let me go through some, some, some that I've written here. You know, maybe a spiritual goal for, for you for 2024 is to be at church every Sunday. You know, don't skip church. Say, you know what, 2024, I'm going to make sure I'm at church every Sunday. You know, that's a good goal to have, good spiritual goal to have. You know, who knows how much more you would grow if you were at church every Sunday rather than every other Sunday or, you know, skipping twice, you know, and coming, you know, maybe you would have grown a lot more in that year spiritually if you were at church every Sunday. Yeah, now we got prayer meetings on Tuesday nights. Yeah, maybe another goal is, hey, I'm going to be prayer meeting Tuesday night. You know, praying for my brothers and sisters in Christ, praying for our country, praying for the world, praying for myself, praying for my loved ones. Now we've got that every Tuesday. That can be a goal. Another goal can be, hey, volunteer in one of the church ministries. You know, some people, not everyone is volunteering in, every, in one of the church ministries. You can say, hey, 2024, can do something for God this year. Help in one of the ministries. You know, make it my own. Take ownership of it. What about Bible reading goals? You know, maybe some people never read through a whole book of the Bible. You, know, you can start small. Hey, let's just read one book. You can read one of the short books. You know, there's like Second John, Third John, Jude, Philemon, you know, some of these books. You know, just read through it. It's like one chapter. You can say you've read a whole book of the Bible. You know, so, you know, some people have been Christians for, for years and years and years. You know, not read more than a few passages in their Bible. Hey, well, yeah, like we talked about breaking bad habits, let's get out of the bad habit of not knowing God's Word, not reading God's Word. Hey, just read through just one book of the Bible and you can grow from there. You know, maybe your goal for 2024 can be to read through the whole New Testament. If you've never read through the New Testament, hey, read through the whole New Testament. Maybe if you've read through the New Testament several times, goal you can set for 2024, hey, I'm going to read through the Old Testament. That's a hard one because, you know, there's hard books in there. You don't understand everything that's being written. But, hey, I'm going to power through it. I'm going to read the Old Testament, try and get as familiar as I can with all these scriptures. And then you can set the goal. Hey, why don't I read through the whole Bible? You know, read through the Old Testament. Read through the New Testament. That's a great goal to have for 2024. You, know, you can have some Bible memorization goals. You know, we've, we've, we've created 100 verses. You know, let's start setting some goals to say, hey, I'm going to memorize 20 of them. You know, I'm going to memorize 10 of them at least. Start small and then build up. And then, you know, even by the end of the year, you may have memorized all 100 of them. And, you know, you're missing out on that blessing of God's word, hiding God's word in your heart, you know, and meditating on them. You know, the Bible talks a lot about, you know, having God's word in your heart, meditating on them. You know, rather than, like I said, the words of the world echoing in your heart and in your mind, let's get God's word echoing in your heart and in your mind and see how it changes your life, changes the way you live. Soul winning goals. You know, if you've never been soul winning, hey, go soul winning for the first time. Just make it a goal. Of just going, hey, I'm going to at least go once in 2024 and go along preaching the gospel to somebody that I would not have otherwise met. You know, for those of you that go soul winning, you know, maybe you've never won somebody to Jesus Christ. You've never, you know, led somebody in prayer and got somebody saved. That's a great goal to have. And in your life, every Christian should have that goal in their life. Just to get one person saved. You know, just get to the point where you understand it enough, you can explain it, you know, you can engage somebody in a conversation, bring them through the plan of salvation, you know, lead them in prayer to call upon the Lord. You know, that's, a, that's an awesome, awesome goal to have. 
You know, as we build up, you know, you win something. What about bringing a visitor to church? You've never brought a visitor to church? Or take a new believer soul winning. You know, preach a sermon. You know, these are some great goals to lead towards, but we don't want to, you know, get to setting New Year's resolutions, setting goals, and then just completely neglect, you know, our spiritual life. So that's what this point is about, right? Let's make sure when we set goals, let's set some spiritual goals. All right, let's go on to number three. Number three, I want to go to the passage that we read this morning in Ecclesiastes 9. And it's, one of, it's one of our, you know, these are the verses I love. This is why they're on the list of 100 to memorize. And number three, number three, take chances. Take chances. You know, living the Christian life is not just living a life of safety. You know, always just living in safety, never stepping out of your comfort zone, being uncomfortable, you know, taking chances, seizing the day, seizing that opportunity. You know, it's, it's not wrong for Christians to be ambitious, right, and to want to strive for something more. That's not, that's not what I believe being content is, right? Being content is just being happy whether you have an abundance or you have little, right? So there's nothing wrong with being ambitious and trying to make something of your life, trying to do something great for God, or, you know, seizing the opportunity. You know, that could be in a, in a cause, it can be in, a, in your career aspirations, or it can be in, you know, finding a companion. You know, it's the same when, you know, singles are trying to find somebody to marry. You know, they have to seize that opportunity. They may meet somebody and, you know, you know seize the day and see if, it, see if it leads to something. But you've got to take chances in life. You've got to be willing to get out of your comfort zone and step out of the boat. Ecclesiastes 9. Look what the Bible says here. Live joyfully with the wife of whom thou lovest all the days of, the life, of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labour which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favour to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared at an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. So what is the general gist of this passage the general gist of this passage is take a chance because you only live once you know enjoy the life that you have that's why it's saying hey enjoy life whatever you find to do do it mightily you know take a chance verse 11 because he's you know solomon has found in life that it's not always the best and brightest that get the prize it's just the person that seizes the opportunity, the person that goes for it. And you see this a lot in sport, where, you know, children, you see, you know, I watch my kids play soccer and whatnot. And you see sometimes the best kids are not the ones that make it. They may have some natural talent, but, you know, they didn't, you know, train and they don't work hard and, you know, get the skills, you know, like, you know, break the bad habits like we talked about. They didn't make it happen. You know, so somebody, when the opportunity arises, who worked harder and, and, and did what was right, actually got the opportunity, actually got the prize. And this is what verse 11 is talking about. Verse 11 is saying here, sometimes it's not always the fastest that wins the race. Sometimes it's not always the strongest that wins the battle. It's not always the wisest that gets the bread. It's not always the one that has the most understanding makes the money. It's not always the one that's the most skillful, gets the favour, gets the opportunity, right? But it says here, time and chance happeneth to them all, right? Sometimes it's just a person 
that seizes the opportunity, you know, that worked hard enough and was ready to take the opportunity, had the chance, he took the chance and got the prize, got that opportunity. So as we think of New Year, going into the New Year, you know, don't, don't be so risk averse that you miss out on these opportunities in life because there are opportunities in life that only come now and then and you have to be willing to seize the moment. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone in order to achieve it. So take the chance because it's not always going to be the best and brightest that get it. It could be you if you just prepare yourself, work hard and seize the moment. You know, this phrase comes from the Bible, to step out of the boat, get out of your comfort zone. It comes from Matthew 14, 25, when Peter walked on water. So we're going to look at this story, and I just want to share a couple of things with you here. We have to be willing to step out of the boat. What does that mean? Get uncomfortable. So verse 25 here in Matthew 14, it says here, and then the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. So this is when they're in the storm, they see Jesus walking on the water towards them. Straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So this is a great story to encourage us to, you know, take a chance. Get out of your comfort zone. Seize the opportunity. You know, maybe you'll fail, but you'll accomplish more trying and failing than if you didn't even try at all, if you didn't try and seize the moment. You've got to get out of the boat. So like Peter did here, a couple of things on this story. Notice here that an opportunity for Peter to do something supernatural, above average, happened in the middle of a storm. So sometimes you think these opportunities is, you know, when all your ducks are in a row and, you know, everything, you've got everything under control and everything's just going smoothly, then you think, ah, now I'm ready for that great opportunity. But notice, Peter walked on water. He stepped out of the boat in the middle of a storm. So this is why you, you need to always be ready. You need to have your eyes open because maybe your life isn't going to be all under control. Maybe you're not all going to have your ducks in a row and that opportunity is going to present itself and you may need to seize that opportunity, get out of the boat, make yourself a little uncomfortable, but then you get to walk on water with Jesus. Now notice here as well, walking on water says here, Verse 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. So walking on water was not Jesus' idea for Peter. Isn't that interesting? So it was actually Peter's idea to say, hey, if Jesus is out there, this is what I want to do, right? It's like, bid me come unto thee on the water. But you see how Jesus allowed him to do what was his idea? So sometimes a great opportunity in your life is an idea that you come up with, right? It's something that you want to do for God. It's not that you wait around, you know, you're all waiting in the boat for God to say, oh, come out onto the water with me. Peter did something great because it was his idea. He said, hey, I'm going to be out where Jesus is in the storm. Bid me come unto thee on the water. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, come. Right? So this was not something that was completely outside of God's will. What, what Peter's idea was. It was within God's will because Jesus said, hey, come out on the water. And then he walked on the water. Now we know the story that as he walks on the water, I mean, he's out there, he's looking at the waves, he's getting a bit scared, he starts sinking. 
But the thing is, even though Peter failed to stay on top of the water, he still walked on the water temporarily, didn't he? He still did something that nobody else has ever done. Nobody else has ever walked on water. But Peter, because he was willing to step out on the boat, he had this idea, he wanted to be with Jesus. He didn't let the storms around him, you know, stop him from coming out of the boat. But yeah, even though he failed in staying on top of the water, he still was out there. And the last thing I just want to say about this passage, the thought I had was, it says here in verse 32, and when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So isn't that interesting that even when Peter was out there, he's walking on the water to Jesus, he fails, he calls out to Jesus, Jesus saves him, pulls him up out of the water. But even as they're walking back to the ship, He's walking with Jesus. Think about this. And yet the storm is still around them. So that just goes to show that you could be, it's like, the, it's like the story of when Jesus is asleep on the boat and they're in the storm. You can be there right with Jesus, doing the right thing, fulfilling God's will, walking with Jesus, and yet still be walking through a storm. And it wasn't until they got back <laughs> to the ship that the winds cease. So I think this story is very encouraging for us, you know, not to always hold back. You know, I guess it does take wisdom in life you know, to know when to get out of the boat and when not to. But if you're somebody that's always living in fear, always, you know, never taking that opportunity, never getting out of your comfort zone, that's not how God wants us to live. He didn't let the disciples live in their comfort zone and he encouraged when Peter stepped out of the boat, he said, come, come and walk with me. I think God wants us to do great things. He wants us to live our life to its full potential. He wants us to do great things for him. And the only way you're going to achieve doing great things is you're going to have to fail. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to step out of the boat. So we don't want fear to hold us back. Don't live in fear of man, right? Let's get out of our comfort zone. Let's take chances. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Luke 12. Look what it says here. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. I realized when I was copying and pasting these verses, this last slide said, hell yeah, I say unto you, fear him. <laughs> no. All right, so... Don't live in fear of man, like we have, you know, and our values over there. You know, that's one thing you strive to do in the new year. You know, read those values every time you come to church and you say, you know what, I'm going to live these values. You know what one number seven is? Fear God, not man. And the last one's a, a quicker point. Number four, I thought the progression of these points made sense. So one, break bad habits. We want to replace bad habits with good habits. So we want to set spiritual goals. And we don't want to just do great things spiritually in our life. You know, you want to take chances in life, you know, even in your career. You know, seize the opportunity. You know, you don't have to be a doormat. You don't have to, you know, be, you know, just always content with where you are. Strive for excellence. And the last one I want to talk about, biblical resolutions to the new year. Number four, start today. Start today. Don't leave it to tomorrow. You know, your resolution, start today. You don't have to wait till January 1st. You know, start all your New Year's resolutions and all the things you want to do. Let's start today. It's New Year's Eve. Why wait till tomorrow? Start today. Life is too short. I want to share with you a couple of verses just on how short life is. So a lot of these come from, all these come from Psalms. And then we have the one we know from James 4. 
Psalms 39, 4. Lord, look at this. Make me to know mine end and the measure of my days. You see this prayer of David? David is saying, saying to God, God, make me understand and realize how short my life is. Make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Is that, is that a prayer? I don't think that's a, is that a prayer that you have ever prayed? It's not a prayer I've ever prayed. But this is a good thing. Then we pray to God and we say, God, help me to understand how frail my life is, how short my life is, so I don't waste it. To know my end, where, it, where to look at the end. Right? Have that eternal view so that it changes the way I live my life. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breadth. He's saying here, the, when they measure the breadth, the breadth of the hand, he's saying that's how short my life is. It's a hand breadth. And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. See long. That's what I'm saying. Start today. Man, life is too short. You know, how much life do we have? We don't have a lot of life. So why wait till tomorrow to do the things you know you need to do because you've put it down as a goal. You say, you say I want to achieve this. So start. Do it. Don't wait. Don't waste time. Don't come to January, uh, December 31st next year and think, oh, I wish I'd done that. You know, and every time we get that year, that year's gone, that year's gone, that year's gone, say, hey, I should have done that, I should have done that, should have done that. Hey, don't live in regret. Don't live in fear. Let's start today. Let's make it happen. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years. Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Saying here, what's the expected life expectancy in the Bible? 70 years, 80 years. But it could be cut short. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Look at what the Bible says here in verse 12. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. You see there, again, a prayer, a request of David that he would be taught to realize how brief life is because when you realize how brief your life is, this is why New Year is always good because people realize their life is going, their life is going. They live their life more wisely. Right? That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalm 103, 15. As for man, his days are as grass and as a flower of the field. So he flourisheth for the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. I always think of this verse, uh, you know, I'm mowing the lawn, and you cut, cut the grass, and you know, you do use the whipper snipper, because you, you know, you have the whipper snipper, and it doesn't like catch the grass, and it just like goes off. And then so quickly, you know, how, how that grass withers in the sun, when it's, once it's cut off, and it just like all dries up. And it's like nothing. You blow it back onto the grass and then it just disappears. And I think, you know, when I, every time I mow the grass, I think that's like, it's like our life. Our life is but a vapour that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. James 4.14 Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, is a good time to reflect and really think about your life gone by, how quick life is going, and life is short. You know, so utilize the time you have to do great things, do great things for God. You know, break those bad, don't waste time on bad habits, break the bad habits, replace them with good habits, set some spiritual goals, you know, take chances, get out of your comfort zone, because life is so short. All right, so you don't want to put things off. You don't want to live your life thinking what could have been, whether in this world or in the world to come. So in conclusion, just a reminder, break the bad habits, set spiritual goals, take chances, and start today.
don't start tomorrow. And, uh, you know, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your words. Thank you for uh, the motivation that your word brings us. Teach us to number our days. Help us to understand the brevity of our life, that it is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Lord, may 2024 be the greatest year so far in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you will use each and every person in our church. Lord, light a fire in their heart that they may accomplish great things for you and for your kingdom. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.